Good morning. Good morning. It's a very early morning. But <laughs> okay. now, the, the, the title of the talk, if I stumble and mutter, it's because for the obvious reason that, that I'm nervous being in a, with strange people, as I said yesterday. Um, the title of the talk is, Now is the Moment to Learn Hope. Now is the moment to learn hope. Now, when there seems so little ground for hope. Now, when refugees and migrants are drowning in the sea. Now, when racism and fascism are surging in Europe, in North America, and elsewhere. Now, when even to mention hope seems like a sick joke or even an insult to the millions and millions of young people who face a life of unemployment or sometimes worse, employment. <laughs> now is the time to learn hope, time to repeat the words with which Ernst Bloch opened his great book, The Principle of Hope, written largely when he was in exile from the Nazis, written in a world dominated by fear. Now, more than 70 years later, fear is on the rise again, and hope, the hope of a radically different world, is in danger of becoming extinct. To learn hope, not just to hope, not just to hope, oh, and think, oh, everything will be fine. No. Bloch spoke of a doctor space, a reasoned hope, a learned hope, a hope with substance, a way of thinking that opens paths to a different world. That, it seems to me, is what can become weak or even be extinguished. And I think we're in danger of that. I suspect that our grandparents, in the same way as they knew much more about trees and birds than we do, probably knew more about hope too. The world is closing. I think that's, that's really what worries me. There is a closure taking place, a very material closure that is supported by a closure of the mind. Walls are going up, borders are becoming stricter and more violent the deeper and deeper penetration of money into education, healthcare, and all areas of life erects barriers to keep out those without money and barriers to keep out any form of thought that does not contribute to the expansion of money. There is a closing of real possibilities of what we can do with our lives but there is also a closing of our senses, a closing of what we are able to imagine, and I think a closing of education, a closing of what children learn in school, a closure, a closing of our capacity to think and feel certain things. And this closure of the mind reinforces the walls that are going up. Writing in 1795, just after the French Revolution or during the French Revolution, William Blake imagined the reactions of the kings of Asia to the revolutionary upsurge in Europe. He imagined the kings calling on their counselors to cut off the bread from the city that the remnant may learn to obey that the pride of the heart may fall, that the lust of the eyes may be quenched, that the delicate ear in its infancy may be dulled and the nostrils closed up 
to teach mortal worms the path that leads from the gates of the grave. And Blake was writing in 1795, but he could easily have been writing this year or last year. He could easily have been thinking of Greece, for example, in the last few years, where the rule of money articulated through the governments of the Eurozone is literally cutting off the bread from the city that the remnant may learn to obey, that the pride of the heart may fail, that the lust of the eyes may be quenched. And from what I hear of, from friends in Greece, that is exactly what is happening. Not just that they are poorer, much poorer than a few years ago, but that there, also, there is also a deep depression. And to learn to hope is to say no to closure, to open our nostrils, sharpen our ears, emancipate the lust of our eyes and the pride of our heart. Above all, it is to open our minds and our senses to the possibility of a radically different world, a world that is not based on money and profit. That is what is closing, perhaps, the confidence or even the dream that there can be a world beyond capitalism. And yet, we know that capitalism is a catastrophe. We all know that. That is not really a tissue. And it is not really controversial or even radical to say that capitalism is a catastrophe. This form of social organization is destroying our lives, causing destruction and misery throughout the world, destroying other non-human forms of life, destroying the necessary preconditions of human existence. And if we do not change radically the form of organization, radically and soon, then it is very possible or indeed probable that it will lead us to extinction. Organizing our relations with other people through money is not just absurd, humiliating, dehumanizing. It also creates a dynamic that nobody controls, not even the richest of capitalists, not even the most powerful of politicians. A dynamic of aggression that is usually called progress a dynamic of aggression that in the song of Banner last night was called war, or more traditionally, a dynamic of aggression that we can call class struggle. A destruction of our lives, our communities, our dreams, our imagination. Radical for me, here we are trying to rediscover the radical this weekend. Radical is not saying how terrible the world is. It's not saying what a catastrophe capitalism is. Because if you actually probe anybody, it seems to me, or not anybody, but a great part of the population on that, people will say, yes, capitalism is a catastrophe, it's a disaster, but we don't have anything else. So radical for me is not saying that capitalism is a disaster, but rather opening our minds to the possibility of creating something else. So that the challenge is not to say that capitalism is a disaster. The, the challenge is really to think beyond it, to go opening our minds and our senses to not just the necessity, but the possibility of breaking capitalism, of breaking it and creating something else. And by that, by hope, 
I do not mean the hope that we might be able to create a fairer capitalism, an anti-neoliberal capitalism. That sort of hope really seems to me to be resignation. It says, in effect, we have to give up on our stupid revolutionary dreams. We know perfectly well what happened in Russia and China. We know that revolution was a failure in the 20th century. Therefore, we have to accept this sick society based on the expansion of profit. But perhaps we can make it a bit better by voting in a government that may not be anti-capitalist, but is at least anti-neoliberal. And so realism comes to replace radical hope. The critique of neoliberalism takes the place of the critique of capitalism. And the problem, the problem with this realism is that it is totally unrealistic. This sort of radical parliamentary, new left, anti-neoliberal, halfway hope simply will not work, as is so clearly illustrated by the spectacular turnaround of the great government of hope, the Syriza government in Greece last year, or indeed by Bolivia or Venezuela today. The danger of this unrealistic realism is that it ends up being totally realistic. No more hope, just repression, as in Greece today. At the end of the day, this realism means accepting the rule of money, the rule of profit, with all the violence and all the suffering that that inevitably involves. The government of hope turned out, in the Greek case, to be a grotesque betrayal of people's hopes. And yet, and yet, I wonder, Corbyn and Sanders and Podemos carry on as though nothing had happened, as though they never read about what happened in Greece. So neoliberalism sounds like a good critical category. But more and more, I'm convinced that its effect is just the opposite. In a way, it is the product of the closing of our minds, the narrowing of our imaginations. We know that capitalism is a catastrophe, but we are no longer able to think beyond it, so we just think of improving it, of trying to go back to a long-dead welfare state which will not return, and not because the politicians do not want it, but because the intensity of capital's crisis is such that there is no room for it. The problem is not neoliberalism, the problem is capitalism. A society organized around money and its expansion. Kill it, create something else. And I say that, I mean, there's a possibility, I'm not, I don't want to say it in a sectarian way. I don't want to say, oh, if you talk about neoliberalism, you're just a reformist. That's not the point. It just seems to me that, yes, we all talk about neoliberalism. We're all horrified by the neoliberal, the effect of neoliberal policies over the last 20 years. But if we don't think beyond neoliberalism, if we don't say, well, the problem is not just neoliberalism, and it's not a question of politicians, of political options. The problem is capitalism. The problem is this grotesque, absurd, 
vomit-making form of social organization. Why on earth do we accept to have money as the central axis of social organization when we know what that means, when we know what that means in terms of dehumanization, degradation, massive inequality, war, violence, and the dynamic that is leading us towards our own destruction. Why on earth do we accept to have money as the axis of our social relations, as the form through which we relate to other people and their activities? That is the problem. Hope, as I understand it, is hope against, or better, hope against and beyond. It is not just, oh, I hope tomorrow will be just like today. Rather, it is, I hope tomorrow will be different from today. And to learn hope means, I think, to have some concept of what we are hoping against. And for me, and even though I sometimes feel that perhaps this sounds very old-fashioned, for me, this means having a concept of capital. A ca concept of capital as a historically specific and therefore potentially transitory form of social relations. A specific way of doing things that is characterized by the rule of money by exploitation, by the commodification of everything that be, can be, be, be commodified. But capital as a way of doing things, if we think that the enemy is capital as a way of doing things, as a way of organizing ourselves, then this puts, puts on the agenda immediately the question of, well, why don't we do things in a different way? Why don't we organize ourselves in a different way? Whereas neoliberalism, it seems to me, puts on the agenda, well, why don't we vote for a different government next time round? So, hope against capital. And then the question arises, Fine, we can say that here. I can say that I know we're in a conference, a radical rediscovering the radical conference. I know that if you're here, then in some sense you must be radical, so easy to make this argument. But if we make it outside, then who will listen? Who will listen if we talk about capital and revolution? Because when we act, or when we write plays, or when we teach, because it seems to me more or less the same thing, we're not just laying down the correct line. We are actually talking to people. And perhaps if we just criticize neoliberalism, then people will listen. If we go against capitalism and talk about revolution, then perhaps people will say, oh no, that's old dogma. We won't listen to that, that's not interesting. And it's too extreme. In the real world, we have to deal with ordinary people. So the question is, in a way, do we not need to tone down our language for them, for the ordinary people of the real world? And I think the answer is no. That we in this room are really not so special. We are, of course, very special, but not all that special. You know, we, we are actually ordinary people. And the most profound and the most challenging thing, I think, that the Zapatistas say is we are ordinary people. We are ordinary women and men, children and old people. That is to say, we are rebels. 
But to say that, to take that seriously, we have to be able to recognize and touch the rebelliousness in everyday life. We have to be able to go to the supermarket and see that old couple over there choosing their, their food. And we have to be able to say they are rebels. Or we have to be able to go home, to go out in the streets perhaps after today's conference and see the young people hurrying home from work or getting ready to go out clubbing. And we have to be able to say they are rebels. And in order to do that, we have to break appearances. We have to understand people as being self-divided, as being self-antagonistic, as being schizophrenic in the popular sense of the word. We have to understand that the grey conformism of the people around us, the grey conformism of ourselves, is in fact composed of contrasting, clashing, black and white. And that this internal clash of contrasts, this internal clash of black and white, yes, is partly absorbed or partly blended into a grey, a conformist grey, but not entirely. Ordinary people are composed of extraordinary parts. Parts that aren't entirely absorbed into the grey beige blend that we normally present to the world. No. That it seems to me that when we teach or when we do theatre, it is not that we are laying down the correct line, that doesn't make sense. We are, of course, talking to people, but perhaps that's not quite right either. We are actually addressing something inside people. We are trying to touch something inside them that does not necessarily fit together neatly with the rest of them. Something kind of loose nerve ends that hang out. We're trying to touch something that doesn't fit, that pushes against and beyond the rest of them. And I think that, that that seems to me that to think of what we are doing, because that's the question, what, what, what are we doing? To think of what we are doing in that way is perhaps the key to thinking beyond the classic problem of always preaching to the converted. No. Preaching to lefties through theater or through teaching is too easy. The problem is how do we reach these contradictions that exist within everybody? So we, when we talk to people, we are reaching for a hidden world. And there is a beautiful, I'm sure you probably all know it, you ought to all know it, but if you don't anyway. Here it is. There's a beautiful <coughs> sentence written by Arundhati Roy that says, another world is not only possible, she's on the way, and on a quiet day, if you listen very carefully, you can hear her breathe. A hidden world, a world that does not yet exist, but is on the way. A world that moves against and beyond the existing world, an anti-identitarian world, if you like, a world that does not yet exist and therefore exists not yet as anticipation, as struggle, as dream, as rebelliousness, as loose nerve ends, as refusal to accept, as scream against the existing society. It is this world, this world that does not exist, that is the axis of hope. And to learn to hope, I think, is to learn to think from a world that does not yet exist. 
could potentially exist, a world that does not yet exist and therefore exists not yet as negation, as refusal, as dream. And we who refuse to accept, we who refuse to abandon hope, what are we doing? As teachers, as theater people, I think we are trying to listen to this world that does not yet exist but is on her way, to hear her breathe and magnify the sound, to hear her breathe by taking as her starting point the millions and millions of refusals, of struggles, of ways of living that push against and beyond creating or affirming other forms of social relations, creating or affirming other ways of doing things, other ways of doing things that take as their central principle, not money, but the creation of the common or the communizing. And perhaps it's not just a question of listening to this other world that's on its way, on her way, but of resonating, of understanding our own activity as resonating with this world of the not yet, as trying to stir vibrations of harmony and discord, trying to recognize, create an old and new music, to move in an old and new grammar of resistance and rebellion, an old and new grammar of rage and hope, of schizophrenia and bright colors, of asking we walk, of creativity. The old idea of revolutionary communication was centered around the idea of class consciousness and bringing consciousness to the masses. And I think that that didn't work very well. It didn't work very well because the hierarchical notion that it was based on actually led, I suspect, to a passivity far removed from revolution. And in any case, the institutional structure on which it was based, the party, the revolutionary party, no longer exists in real terms. Now I think it is better to think of resonances. We are surrounded by often half-conscious, rebellious angers or experiments that often find difficulty in articulating themselves and in communicating with other rebellious angers. I see theater, music, teaching, writing, dancing as attempts to resonate with those angers and communicate and with those angers and to promote their confluence. I mean, obviously, there are also very conscious angers, very conscious anti-capitalist organizations, and it seems to me very important as well to think of radical theater, theater as strengthening those. I mean, I think that's a bit what we saw last night with the wonderful performance of, of Banner. But I think we have to go beyond that. I think we have to try and touch these unorganized, inarticulate, half-conscious rebelliousnesses, angers, experiments of doing things in a different way that exist all over the place, literally all over the place, and that that is the real challenge for us, whether we are teachers or, or theater people. And in this world, in this hidden world that we are trying to reach. I think we have to accept that rage is fundamental. That the world that Arundhati Roy can hear in her gentle words 
is actually a world of anger, a world of rage. And the last few years have made it very clear what a powerful substratum of rage is present even in the apparently most tranquil societies and what nasty forms it can take. Rage is a fundamental part of a society based on exploitation and destruction. Rage is fundamental to a society built on the frustration of our creative capacities. A society that forces us to mold those creative capacities and sell them in the service of the expansion of profit. There is a structural anger built into the society even when we are not conscious of it. And it is now clear that that anger is erupting in ways that are very destructive. Hope is unthinkable with ang without anger. I think hope grows from anger. Hope grows from saying, no, we cannot accept society as it is. We must go somewhere else. So hope is unthinkable without anger. Hope is directed against an aggressive, disgusting, foul, pestilent society. But that certainly does not mean that anger necessarily leads us forward in the pursuit of what we hope for. There is an anger then that opens and an anger that closes, that builds wall. There is a dignified rage, a rage with dignity, a dignarabia, as the Sapatistas called it. And they dedicated a festival to the theme of la dignarabia about five years ago. A rage of resistance and rebellion. And there is also a rage that perpetuates the oppression of capital, a rage that does not seem capable of going beyond the established categories of money and state. There is the rage of a world waiting to be born and the rage that is trapped inside the, world, the walls of a dying world, a rage without hope. The world that is on her way is a world of anger, an anger that breaks barriers, a world where anger and hope are inseparable. Somehow then we have to touch that rage that is so deeply woven in society today and make that rage ours, to help it to break barriers, to infuse it with a hope that takes us beyond capital. That seems to me just so urgent at the moment. In this hidden world, okay, there's a rage that we must touch. There is also a creativity and a need for creation. This actually doesn't help us very much if we go out on Saturday and break the windows of the banks and then on Monday we have to go back to work and start rebuilding capitalism again. That doesn't get us very far. And if we say we want more jobs, we want more employment, this, this is really the current situation, the situation in Greece, I suppose, last year, this year too. If we say, well, we want more jobs, we want more employment, then the logical answer, the gov answer that the government always gives is that if you want employment, then you, we must create conditions that are favorable to capitalist investment and creating cap conditions favorable to capital in capitalist investment means that, yes, we can create more jobs, but you'll have to accept lower pay, you'll have to accept that you won't have any rights, you'll have to 
accept dreadful conditions. And so we're trapped. So that the only thing we can do is to realize that to be against capital is to be against labor. No? To be against capital is to be against that monstrous transformation of our daily activity into a labor dedicated to the expansion of profit. And there must, even if you work in this state, or even if you, whatever you do, I mean, we all know finally that people won't employ you unless you are contributing in some way to the reproduction of the system. Okay, they can make mistakes and we can make, take advantage of, of um, contradictions in the system. Yes, that we can do. But at the same time, we have to understand that really rejection of capital is rejection of employment. And how can we do that? Well, we can only do that if we have alternative ways of living. We can only do that if we actually create different ways of surviving, and not just surviving, of living. No, we can only do that if we are able to say to the government, or, you know, we're not interested in more employment. Go and stuff your, your jobs. We actually are creating a different kind of living. I think that is absolutely necessary. I think it's being realized more and more. There are more and more people in the world who by necessity or by choice are doing everything they can to realize that those other forms of living. But I think we also have to recognize that that is our weakness. No? That in our moments of rebellion, we do actually need employment in order to survive. And to, if we want employment, then we have to accept that that means creating conditions favorable to the accumulation of capital. That, that, that is our great, our great problem. Okay, so that, that's a problem in the hidden world. The other thing, the, which really, um, takes us to the, the, the third problem, the third, third issue in this hidden world that we're trying to, 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 to touch, I think, is the understanding that um, this, this world waiting to be born is a world that walks asking. Hope, as Bloch put it, is a utopian star, not a blueprint for the future. We have a general idea of where we want to go, distilled from the dreams of hundreds of years of struggle, but we have no definite plan. We no longer have a defined, a clearly defined highway to revolution, thank goodness. The only paths forward are the ones we make by walking them, and the world that we want to create is a world of many worlds, so that hope is necessarily a creative experimental movement, the creation of spaces and moments of resistance and rebellion, the creation of cracks in the texture of capitalist domination, of spaces and moments in which we refuse to follow the rule of money, the rule of capital, and create other ways of doing things against and beyond the existing world. And all of these cracks are contradictory. All of these cracks are crazy. But there are millions and millions and millions of them. And probably all of us here are involved in creating them in some way. And that the only way I can conceive of revolution today is as the recognition, creation, expansion, multiplication, and confluence of such cracks. Listen carefully, and we can hear the old world cracking. Look carefully, and we see that that is precisely what we are doing here this weekend.
in the program, it says something about my optimistic vision. So is this the optimistic vision that you were promised? I'm not sure that it is. <laughs> what I feel, I suppose, is that we are probably now in a race where there are just two competitors. On the one hand, the drive towards the self-annihilation of humanity, you know, driven by money, quite uncontrolled by any conscious will. And on the other, the abolition of capitalism and the creation of a self-determining, communizing society. And in this race, who will win? We do not know. But it is clear that we are not neutral observers, that we do actually have our preference that we support the second competitor, the communizing one, that we bet on her, because in a way that's, that's exactly what we do with our lives and that with our teaching or our theater, we bet on a possible outcome. And we will do all we can to make sure she wins. Our hope is that she should win, even if often we feel that she has no chance. And in order to support her, we need to learn hope. I... I am a fairy. Whenever I give an opening talk, it's not quite an opening talk, but it's almost an opening talk at a conference, I think that this turns me into a fairy who's been invited to expre ex express my wishes for the event that is just beginning its life. And my wishes for the discussions of these days, of today and tomorrow, are that they should go beyond moaning about how awful existing society is to thinking about how to change it. That they should perhaps push beyond the critique of neoliberalism to the critique of capitalism. That they should focus on how we can touch that hidden world of the not yet that is on her way, how we can touch and express and strengthen that angry, creative, hopeful push towards a different society. Thank you. Um, I think for me it was probably the first time I'd uh, really clearly heard the sort of distinction made between parliamentary democratic socialism um, or the, the type of politics advocated by Sanders and Corbyn as opposed to a complete sort of rejection of any form of, of capitalism. Um, so I found that really interesting and, and quite challenging. So happy to take questions now. Um, if people want to raise hands. If you could say your name. Um, and the organisation you're from, that would be really helpful for us. Thanks. There's, there's two questions there. I'll take, there's roving mics around as well, so if you just wait for the mic to come. I'll take the gentleman here who's got the mic there. Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, my name's Asher. I'm from Soldow to Youth and Leeds Beckett University. Um, you mentioned that you shouldn't reduce the complexity of language when kind of discussing socialist or radical ideas. Um, but I kind of made some notes, so I'll read these. Um, but like, what kind is the common language in socialist discussion? Because there's a big difference between Karl Marx and um, a more contemporary writer like Owen Jones. And why shouldn't you make um, radical debate more accessible to people who could be excluded when 
sometimes these issues directly impact people who wouldn't have um, maybe very high linguistic skills in English. Great, and I'll just take, there's a second question there, which we'll just take at the same time. You can just pass the mic along, the gent in the black t-shirt. Uh, my name is Javier Sanchez, and I'm from Solidarity Hall. Um, my, I just want to ask whether you agree that one of the problems with the analysis of um, capitalism through Marxism or communism is the fact that race is excluded and therefore uh, and, and sexism is excluded so therefore we don't don't take into account that this is what is feeding capitalism um, and also that in order for us to move forward and not just preach to the converted that we need to lose our fears of others and go into the ghettos and go into the places where no one wants to go and work with people from other nationalities and other colors and, and whatever. Um, I just wonder if you agree with that. Thanks, John, do you want to answer those two? Sure. Yeah, you can answer those ones. Hmm? Yeah, we yeah, won't take any more if you want to answer those two questions. Okay, okay quickly, the, the first one, I, I agree entirely. I think that we have to, in a way, that's what I meant when I said well, we're talking to people. You know, we, we actually want to reach people. We want to touch people, things inside people. I didn't mean that we have to choose our language accordingly. But what I feel is that that sometimes becomes translated into we mustn't say anything too harsh or too strong. Um, and I think that that's what's wrong. We're actually trying to address things inside people and we're trying to address um, a rage that's inside people. And I think there are ways of saying to people, not just, oh, the Tory government is dreadful. There are ways of saying this society with its terrible inequality, grotesque inequality, this society in which all important decisions are shaped by money and profit, this society stinks to high heaven. I think most of us can understand that. <laughs> no? That's what I'm saying. Don't water down language in order to reach people. It's actually the other way around. No? Um, on the question of, 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 of race and gender, um, I suppose, yeah, um, what I feel is that in order, it's really a question of understanding, in order to talk of hope, it's a question of understanding our capacity to change things. Okay, in order to understand our capacity to change things, we have to focus on how things are done. How, or, how, we, what is, how is our everyday activity shaped? And how can we think of shaping us in a different way, individually and, of course, above all, collectively? That is why, for me, capital is about the organization of our relations with other people. And I think that's why I go to that and say, well, that is the key. After that, of course, we can argue, and I would argue and have argued, that really it's, it's this way of the organization of, of our doing that generates um, ways of seeing society, that generates identitarian categories, that pushes us into defining um, racial identities or sexual identities, but that if we're really trying to ch talk about changing things radically, then we have to go to the root, and the root is people themselves and their activity in the way in which that activity is organized. To quote almost literally from, our, from Karl Marx. You know. 
Um, on the question of going out into the ghettos, well, um, I think it's a little bit... It's, yeah, I mean, I think that we, we want to touch anger. I mean, yes, I think it's important, for example, for university people who work in universities like myself to go out, to break that, to, to be in touch and talk to all sorts of organizations and um, all sorts of groups. Um, that is part of the stimulus for what we do, and it's part of trying to break, break down the academic barrier. Um, yes, that I agree with, absolutely. Okay, so we've got a couple, I, I know there's a lady with a question there, so there's three rows in, and then there's a, a gent a few rows back, we'll take those two questions. So. Joyce Kanin uh, left Birmingham City University due to its toxicity, um, popular educator, critical pedagogue, preparing to spend some time at uh, the University of Serra in Fortaleza, Brazil, working with the this movement, things like that, really excited. Uh, my question to you, John, is thank you for, well, a statement first, then a question. Thank you for that powerful um, speech, which moved me, which is to say, it is moving me towards moving me towards something different. And um, I think I'm not the only one to say I'd like a copy of it and possibly even a virtual copy of it to share with others the process of speaking it because that speaking itself makes the process that you're talking about more visceral. It touches us. Um, my question is about, about a very small part, but actually an interlinked part of your talk, which you, you mentioned. Um, and I, I wonder if you can talk a bit more about, which is you said this, that what you're talking about is something that is not just in and through language, not just in and through reason, but in and through emotion. Can you talk about, and, and the, our senses and the, the parts of our being that are touched, can you talk about more about that process of touching and how it integrates our being? Okay, can we just take one more question before John responds? There's a chap at the, about four rows back there. Just on your side, on the left. Hi. Um, yeah, Rod Dixon from Red Ladder. Um, uh, first of all, John, yeah, I completely agree that we won't find peace in the world until we end the war inside us. And when we all become a peace zone, then we'll be more open and, and have a clear, clearer view about how to move on. But in the short term, w what would you think... I think I know what your answer is, but what would you think with the way that we are tinkering with capitalism? Such an example uh, 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 as in Utrecht where they're trying the universal basic income, which encourages people not to work. Basically, if you, if you choose to work, then that's your choice, but you, you will have enough from the state to exist and paint and learn to play the guitar or just watch shit television. Um, uh, that mind shift is, is coming, I feel, but is that just tinkering with capitalism and is that not enough? Um, yes, on the first question, um, I think it is, yeah, I mean, I, I suppose that, that's in a way what I want to learn about this weekend, isn't it? I mean, that... that um, I think it is important that we try what we are trying to do, or what is really to, to, to touch other people, other angers, other emotions, loves, all sorts of things that kind of burst or go against or burst the banks of, of, of a society based on money. Um, I, mention, I think the category of resonance for me is very important. You know? I mean, how do we, it isn't a question of telling people that's the way it is, it isn't just an intellectual message, it's a question of trying to, 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 to set off a kind of vibration between different angers or different. Um, and I see, I think in the old model, it was very much, yes, it was kind of a, a top down, um, intellectual way of spreading consciousness to the masses. And I think now what we're thinking of is really a much more 
horizontal process in which we recognize that we have an anger and a hope and a desire and a love inside ourselves. And we want to bring that into vibration or into resonance with others. Um, and then I think, yes, of theater and I think of poetry and I think of music as really being extremely important forms of resonance. And then I think, oh, but maybe that's what I try to do as well. Maybe writing is just that. I mean, maybe um, writing is just, yes, you're trying to, to, to set off resonances, you're trying to, 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 to reach people. And I suppose one of the things I'd like to learn about, or I'm learning about already in this, this weekend, is really this notion of resonance and how we reach people and how we reach people not just the converted, but other people as well. No. And the other question... Um, universal basic income and whether that's oh just yeah. the... I mean, the uni I think um, the universal basic income is something I haven't thought about all that much. It does seem to me it, 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 it's a good idea, but it's bound to come into very sharp conflict with capital. You know, if people can have a universal basic income that actually allows them to live and not just to, to scrape by in humiliating conditions, then why would they go to work? If they don't go to work, capital will collapse. Um, it's so great if you think of, yes, I mean, look, there's all this wealth in the world. You know, we... It is absolutely appalling that in order to get access to the wealth that we create, we have to go through all these hoops. You know, we have to follow certain things. We have to sell our creative capacities for a wage. That is absolutely dreadful. You know, of course, we should all have access. There should be universal access to a share of this vast wealth. But I can't see capital creating us, except I can't see capital <coughs> accepting us, except perhaps under very, very tight conditions, as they have done with the whole welfare state or with supplementary benefit um, in particular. No? So I think I'm, uh, I'm going to look for a, for a nod from Sarah. The, John's speech was being streamed online. Will it remain online and available for people to watch after the event? It will. The other thing, um, I was going to ask you to know, is actually, we decided not to print out scraps of my office book of the paper, but they will all be online. And also, anybody who is happy for us to do where they can put their papers online and any presentations and slides, so you'll be able to access all that electronically after the event. Great, thanks, yeah. Sarah. And if anybody wants to contact me by email to ask for a copy or whatever, then... Thanks, John. Then, and the other thing I should have said, but in case I don't say it afterwards, is thank you very much indeed to, to our signer. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>
sometimes pride ourselves in creating these cracks where we have these moments, these spaces where we find them, we create them. Um, but I think there's also then, your vision is much larger than that. It's not, while well, we see spaces and moments, when do we, and how do we, and have you seen cracks that are beginning to take root? And play, so I'm very curious about, for instance, the Zapatistas, which you referenced. I think we see it in communities, maybe even, you know, I think of something like um, Findhorn, um, communities which have some substance and been long lasting. And these aren't to say, well, I'm not talking about perfection, but instead attempts. And when attempts actually begin to take root, and how do we see them, recognize them, celebrate them, and begin to create, as I think a lot of people are interested in here today, that dreaming the future. Um, how do we begin to paint that picture? But where do we see them? And, and can we help identify them and support them when we do see them, particularly as artists? I should take one more question. There's a, a chap there. Yep. I'll take that question. Thanks. Uh, hello, my name is Viv. Um, I'm lucky to say that I've, um, I've almost never worked in the last 30 years. I've managed to make my living um, <laughs> by not doing it. Um, I wanted to ask you about, you talked about the self-divided. And the, and the Zapistas saying that they're ordinary people. And um, I want to know about where you think people resource themselves when, when all the mirrors around are, are corrupted and whether there's still a need for a context, like a concept like soul or spirit. And um, uh, there's a, a Ken Wilber talks about the, the ultimate capital being the personality. And that until we're prepared to let go of that, they'll. Um, there'll always be aggression. And I wonder how you feel about the world of social media where people are almost creating themselves as, um, as, as an object to be, to be marketed um, and whether we need uh, somehow to, to get rid of that cult of personality and become more ordinary. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, on the first one, yes, I think um, the way I think, I suppose I think the, 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 the possibility of changing society radically, I think there are two ways of thinking about it. One is really to say, well, we have to convince everybody and we'll build up a movement and we'll take the state in some way and then we'll bring about change. I think that doesn't work. That hasn't worked. Um, and usually it leads to disaster and disillusionment. Okay. The other way is really to say, well, no, we'll go ahead and do it. You know, we'll do it collectively, as collectively as possible. Individually, if, if we don't have any friends, fine. We'll do it on our own. No? Um, but better if we can do it collectively. And we'll try and shape our our lives, or will shape moments in our life, or will shape spatial spaces, and say here, in this space, in this moment, we're not going to um, be dominated by money and the needs for, for profit. Okay, we still have problems because we have to relate to the outside world. We'll always have contradictions. But within this moment, we're very clear that's what we're going to do. We can say in this conference, we are very clear. You know, really, we want to think of how we can break this system that is breaking us. You know? How, and within that, we are going to try and relate to one another in a different way. We're not going to try and, you know, we're going to try and do play out our different, our little crack. And okay, the moment the crack is something that will only last to this particular crack, will only last a couple of days. But then we'll go home and we'll, to, in different ways, we'll probably reproduce what, what we have learned. Now, and if you ask, well, what about a rooted crack and a massive crack, then yes, the obvious example that occurs to me is the Zapatistas, no? where they've been um, really going about
building their own world no, for, what, 30 years? No? Um, and enormously impressive, enormously powerful and terrific. But there are also lots of things, lots of, I think, experiments in between that um, I suppose I come across. I, that perhaps, I don't know if they exist more in Latin America than in other other parts of the world. I'm sure they exist everywhere. But, um, I mean, two examples that strike me was um, one is of a cooperative in Venezuela. Um, nothing to do with the Chavez government. They've existed for 40 years. They are basically a cooperative of cooperatives and they organize a weekly um, what they call, and it's a strange name, a kind of festival of consumption. But it's actually a weekly um, supermarket, if you like, for selling the products of the cooperatives. And the strange thing, I went to visit it a couple of times, and the strange thing, well, lots of strange things. One is that they don't use cash registers, because they say, well, cash registers are a form of control. We'd just rather trust the people who are working with us. You know, we're not going to use this. The other thing is that although they've got this massive operation, they have a turnover of something like half a million dollars each, each weekend. Although they've this massive operation, they spend most of their time sitting around and talking about what they're doing and their um, social relations and how to do things differently and how to create a different world. And that, that, yeah, I mean, it's been there in very, at times in very difficult circumstances. Now from, they've got their own clinics, they've got um, other activities as well. They've been there for more than 40 years. <clears throat> Another, the other example, um, one that I'm more involved in, is an, is an example in the in the state of Puebla, where I live in Mexico. Um, and there at about um, an hour and a half from the city of Puebla, where I live, there's this, um, in a village, there's, um, I suppose, an educational experiment, you know, where they started off creating a, a high school and then they now have degrees and they now have master's degrees as well. And they think of what they're doing in Zapatista terms as an education in um, digna labia, in dignified rage. You know? And the students, a lot of them are teachers in rural communities and they're social, act and they're social activists and um, yeah, mainly that. And they've been going for, I think, for 40 years as well. And, you know, there are these extraordinary things that you discover um, and, and yeah, that have been doing amazing work in very difficult circumstances, really for long periods. Yeah. Um, We've asked a question about, I think it's a general question about social media. Oh yes, maybe I, was, <laughs> maybe I was deliberately forgetting <laughs> that, I don't know. Um, yeah, just because it, it's difficult. Um, I just don't know how to answer on the question of social media. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, of course, that people go creating their own image, their own personality, etc. Um, I suppose what I feel is that it's a very important. You know, we have a tendency, I think, to, to kind of um, disqualify things, to the, dismiss things, especially um, when those things come from younger people. Um, and I think it's very important to try and see that all these process are, processes are contradictory. Um, yeah, that's really about as far as I can go on that one. Ah, the soul. Sorry. Ah, okay. Ah, okay. Yeah, no, certainly we do that. And, I think you can't underestimate the extent to which young people have been conditioned to sort of think in that way. And I think they do. Social media has become a, a useful tool for people to create a sort of brand around themselves, which, which people operating in the today's labour market recognise 
that's what you need to sell yourself. Um, but, but I think that's always been true, no? I mean, it, a capitalist society is based on the idea that you have to sell yourself, you have to sell your creative capacities, your labor power. The very, very, that very notion creates a, a pressure to build your personality, to build your CV, to present an image. No? And that image will never correspond to, to how you actually experience yourself. Um, I think certainly that in recent years that is becoming more accentuated because it's becoming more difficult or there's more pressures on people to sell themselves more and more literally. But, yeah. yeah. Okay, there's, a, there's time for a couple more questions. There was a lady with a black top in the corner there on this side who had a hand up. Right by, yeah. This lady. Um, so my, I, it was just a question really, and it goes back to the question about race and sexism, and um, and and for me would be homophobia as well and transphobia. And it was about the um, in Mexico in the collective of coll uh, uh, cooperatives about having conversations and discussions. Is the do you hear conversations about? diversity and challenging homophobia and sexism within those conversations when people are sitting talking about, you know, um, the price of whatever or, do you know what I mean? Yeah, I know. we've got one more question. There's and I'm from Open Class Theatre Company, by the way. So there's the lady at the front here who's, who caught my eye before, sorry to others who had their hands up. Take the last question here. Okay. Um, I'm Jackie Ivamy from Ex Nihilo Theatre Group. Um, a very quick comment. We've, we've been having some wonderful theatre on stage now where John's beautiful words have been translated into possibly even more beautiful gestures. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, I think that's <laughs> some, something to be, to be um, appreciated. Um, but uh, I just wanted to say that theatre for all of us, I think, is a continuum. Um, we have at one end um, sort of uh, the theatre of the future, if you like, when we get together in a group. We're all equal, um, it doesn't matter our backgrounds, our ethnicities, whatever, whatever. We come together with our various talents and perhaps we discover that we have talents that we didn't know about and we share them and out of that we produce something very live, very immediate and I thought that maybe Collective Encounters here is, is representative of that kind of group. Uh, at the far other end we've got the um, West End musical where um, actors who've worked in it have told me they, they feel just like commodities and the whole thing is packaged and, and all about money. Um, but in between, there's, it, it is a very big continuum and in, in, in between there are the theatres that do great stuff, but necessarily in the financial world. And I suppose the question to John is, um, you know, how do, we, how do people here who want to work at uh, at the extreme good end, um, <laughs> what is the message? Because eventually, probably everybody's going to have to um, work more towards the other end. Okay, on, on, on the first um, question, the, the example that leaps to mind, which is really for me a lovely example, is in the question of language, you know, that in, in Latin America, obviously, people, the tradition is to address people as compañeros, you know, in left-wing movements or revolutionary movements. The Zapatistas, from the beginning, have always said compañeros y compañeras. You know? And then about three years ago, um, they started to modify that to say, Compañeros, compañeras, y compañeroas. No? So they always now address themselves to men, women, and those who don't fit in between the two genders. So yes, this is very much a live issue in the, in the um, revolutionary or rebe rebellious movements in Mexico. Um, the other question, yeah, I mean, I think that's really the problem for all of us. I mean, how do we, how do we relate to money? You know, how do we say we, money stinks? How do we say um, a society based on money is grotesque, is awful, we must break 
the rule of money, we must break the power of money. And at the same time, of course, we, 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 we have to survive. And at the same time, of course, we, we want to take, to share in the richness produced by society. And access to that richness is dominated, is controlled by money at the moment, principally, not entirely. Um, and I think we're all caught in that. I mean, how do we create, how do we actually go radically against and say, well, you know, we're going to live without money, as some people manage to do, or how do we create spaces in whatever it is that we're doing in which we push as far as we can to um, do other things, to create other spaces, um, and I think this is probably something we're all very conscious of, and that this all is very much part, part, part of our lives. I mean, I, as a university professor, I receive my, my salary. I, you know, um, that means, yes, that there are certain things that, that I have to do, but I'm actually, in, in, I suppose, very fortunate in, have, in being part of a space where we are all very clear, I think, that our activity, we want to, to devote our activity to, um, to building up um, an anti-capitalist, a specific, explicitly anti-capitalist um, space within the university. Um, and we're able to do that, that's fine. Of other people may have much, much less margin because, of, um, because they have a boss or because they have to look for grants or whatever. But I think we're all involved in that. I mean, that's really the, the struggle that reaches into our lives, shape our lives. But we should never assume from the beginning that, that, that it's lost. Um, I think we just have to, 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 to handle those contradictions in some way. And to say, well, no, I mean, our priority, our priority is actually to do something that seems important to us, you know, and that opens the way towards a different society. Um, yeah, I don't really, I mean, I think we're all caught in that. We have different ways of dealing with that situation. No? Okay, great. Uh, so just coming up to 11 o'clock, I know there's a few other people had their hands up. I'm sure John's happy to talk to people during the break. So just give John a round of applause. For <laughs>